Good evening and welcome to the History and Genealogy virtual classroom. Today is Thursday, December 7th, and the time is 6.35 p.m. Thank you for joining us. My name is Scott Hall, and I will be moderating this Zoom session. Today's class, Finding Immigrant European Ancestors, will be taught by Mike Bridwell. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library website and on the library's YouTube channel. If you are viewing this Zoom webinar live, you are encouraged to type questions using the Q&A feature located um, somewhere on your screen. The instructor will answer questions at the end of this session. I have put the link to the class handout in the chat. I will now turn this over to Mike and we will begin the class. Hi. Hi everyone. As Scott said, my name is Mike Bridwell. I work in the History and Genealogy Department. I've been here since 2005. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, immigration and naturalization research. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background about doing uh, immigrate. We'll start with immigration and if you, if you have a handout, if you've had a chance to print it out, I'm gonna be following along primarily. We might take a few side quests, but for the most part, we're gonna follow the handout step by step. Uh, and I'm going to assume that if you're here that you probably have uh, figured out that this isn't easy, um, or at least it can be challenging. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to give you some tips that I use when I'm doing this kind of research. Uh, it uh, may be, um, hopefully it'll be able to help you in the future. So a little bit of background about immigration in the US. Um, immigration research is really about finding your immigrant ancestor and when they arrived in the United States. And that's primarily found on passenger lists, although there are other um, sources that you can uh, use to establish a date of arrival. But passenger lists are, are the most common. And they're also known as ships manifest. And what they are are just a list of passengers that are on a ship when it arrives in port. So, um, so an act of Congress passed in March of 1819 required uh, the captain or master of a vessel arriving at a port in the US or any of its territories from a foreign country to submit a list of passengers to the collector of customs beginning January 1st, 1820. So what it was is just every, every ship's captain had to turn in a, a manifest, a list of passengers who were on the ship beginning in 1820. And what that means is that uh, prior to 1820, um, those kind of lists, uh, they, I'm sorry, excuse me, um, they weren't required to be uh, turned into anyone. Uh, so um, there can be, I mean, some of them have uh, survived um, history, but unless someone, um, really good care of the original or maybe uh, uh, donated it to an archival library or something along those lines. Um, these, the passenger lists that did exist um, often didn't make it through uh, history to us. But so from that point on, 1820 on, uh, when a ship uh, captain turned in his passenger list, uh, they were kept at, at the customs house and eventually they were torn, turned over to the National Archives. And the National Archives has um, collected all of these uh, records from the various ports of entry. And there's more than uh, just New York. Um, and they collected them and they have archived them, of course, but they've also made microfilm copies of the original records. And when you're searching and looking for original records online, and you find passenger lists, this is probably what you're finding is a, is a digital copy of the original manifest, which is kept at the National Archives. Um, so if your, if your uh, ancestors immigrated to the US 
after 1820, there should be, quote, should be uh, a record of their arrival. Now, there are a lot of reasons why it may not exist anymore. And there, we know there have been uh, passenger lists lost. Um, they've been damaged and ruined. Uh, they, uh, but we have, you know, the, the law did exist. And for the most part, the captains complied. And so we have a, a pretty significant percentage of the arrivals coming in to the U.S. from 1820 uh, up to at least the middle of the 20th century. So, if your ancestors came before 1820, what do you do then? That's the question, right? And to be honest, it's, it's challenging. There's no doubt about it. Um, the, the primary resource that I would recommend to anyone doing uh, pre-1820 immigration research is, um, is a, a, a set of books actually titled Passenger and Immigration Lists Index. Um, it's often known by um, colloquially as, a, as Philby's because the author's name is William Philby. So we often call it Philby's, but the Passenger and Immigration List Index is the correct title. And it was initially published as a three volume set in eight, uh, 1981, but there have been supplements that have been published in uh, succeeding years since. Currently, the library owns 46 volumes of these indexes. Uh, they contain over 4.5 million names from 2,500 different sources. Um, this is what the book looks like. This is like one of the books I, I want to show you. Oh, it's, of course, it's reversed, but uh, it's Passenger Immigration List Index. These are referenced, so they can't be checked out. Um, so you know, the, during the pandemic, it, it, it's going to make it difficult for you to come in and look at these. You can't check them out and you can't come into the library. So, um, and we can't really, because each volume is its own complete A to Z index. If you were to ask us to look up uh, your ancestor's name in this book, for one thing, we would more than likely find multiple uh, people with that name. And two, um, we, we would have to look through the index of 46 different volumes because we can't know for sure. Um, we only know the date that the book was, the index was published. We don't know, um, the, the records come from a variety of time periods, from a variety of different types of records. And, and so uh, it's, it's you, you, you'll have to, you will uh, individually, when you are able to access these books again, We'll have to come in and pull them off the shelf individually one at a time and search for your names of your immigrant ancestors. The great thing about the book is it gives you their name, uh, the date of the arrival, the port of arrival, and it also tells you the source for uh, th this information. And they have a list of sources at the front. And so you can go and find out all about that book and, or record or you know where it's located and, and how you can get your hands on it. And, uh, or you can just search for it in a card catalog. I mean, it's possible, in fact, it's probable that uh, a number of the sources that are in Philby's are on our shelves, um, but they're individual books uh, rather than a big collection. So, um, so you just, it's a simple index. You just go through each volume, you look for your individual. And if the time is, the time frame is right, then you can, uh, um, delve in a little further, find out more about the, the record itself, the original record, where it's located. Uh, is it a, a, an original? Is it the original manifest? Or is it a, did someone um, just copy all of the names and the information found on the index or on the passenger list down into a book? That's often the case. Um, but Philby's, again, has, has searched thousands of books and, and record sets and different resources. And it is the quickest, simplest way to look for records for people coming prior to 1820. Um, other possibilities could be um, the personal records of uh, the individual themselves, either uh, 
their the records that they created when they came here. So for instance, when in preparing for this class tonight, I was looking through one of my former co-workers. He had a record uh, of his, uh, of a grandmother, great grandmother who died in 1902. And the death record in the church actually listed uh, the town she came from, how many years she had been here and so on. So, I mean, it, it made it very simple to go back and find the record. And this woman, uh, her name was Elizabeth Meyer. So she was especially challenging to find. I mean, Meyer's such a common last name and her father was Frederick. And so finding Frederick Meyer with a daughter named Elizabeth was, was, I mean, there were just page after page of them, but this record, this death record in a church uh, book, uh, uh, the sacramental book of a, of a Protestant church in South County listed all of the information that you would need to find that person. And he actually used that information then to go find the original passenger list. It was out there, but he was having, to, there were just such an enormous volume of people with this common surname that it was impossible for him to find any other way. Um, so that's Philby's. Uh, the other um, th thing I just want to mention is there's another website it's called immigrantships.net, and it's on our. Uh, it is on our. Uh, shoot, and I'm having trouble. Here it is. Um, it's on our handout, so the URL is on the handout. And I just want to mention it briefly. This is a set of volunteers who are doing this totally out of the goodness of their heart to help people further their uh, research they have been indexing pre-1820 passenger lists. And you can find these lists here. There's uh, 20 volumes of them at this point. And you just click on a list and um, you can uh, browse them by surname. And uh, so you get the surname and the ship that they came in on. And if you click on the link, it gives you a list of it. Now, this is obviously these are passenger lists from all time periods. This particular one that I happened to click on was from 1879. So this is one that we could find in any of the other indexes to um, the Port of New York. But <clears throat> nonetheless, there are pre-1820 uh, passenger lists, and it's all free and uh, very simple to, to access. So it's just another op uh, option for you. Um, for doing free online research since you can't come in uh, to the library. Um, I mean, the only other thing that I will mention about pre-1820 is that there are other things that you can look at, newspapers, um, family histories, uh, often this kind of information from our earliest ancestors who came in colonial times, this information has made its way down to us through time, either through family histories or uh, bi biographies that have been written. So that's another, family histories are another uh, option for um, this type of research, finding that immigrant ancestors uh, date of arrival uh, and, and uh, port and, and, and ship. Um, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to uh, the post 1820 immigration records now. And the first place, the most obvious place to start is at Ancestry.com. Uh, um, let's, start, let's start at our homepage. Let me back up and say that if you uh, have a St. Louis County Library card, uh, Ancestry has, a, a made, um, uh, has allowed us to make Ancestry available at home uh, for people with a St. Louis County Library card. So if you have a library card, you can come to the St. Louis County Library website and you can access Ancestry just like you would have if you were in the library previously. Let me back up and just digress a little bit. Previously, um, we could only offer Ancestry to our patrons in the library. But um, currently during the pandemic, Ancestry is allowing us to offer Ancestry Library Edition to our patrons through our website. So if you go to the St. Louis County Library's website, webpage, and go to research, hover over research here, and click on online genealogy resources. That'll take you to a list of the databases 
that we subscribe to. And it's an alphabetical list. And if we just scroll down here a little bit, you can find Ancestry Library Edition, which is temporarily available re remotely. So uh, when you click on this at home, let's see, uh, I don't think I'm signed. Yes. So when you click on this at home, this will come up and it asks you for your last name, your library card number and your pin. Your pin was assigned to you when you got your library card. So uh, if you don't know it, it's, it's possible. Um, you can contact us here at the library and we can help reset your pin so you can get access to it. But once you enter that data in, then uh, it's gonna come here, which you're, I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, if you're from, uh, I shouldn't say I'm sure, this is the library edition of Ancestry. So um, most of you are probably familiar with Ancestry.com. This is our subscription. And what I would tell you to do is come to search and click on the search button and come down to immigration and travel. Um, so you can, uh, um, you can just plug a name in here, but that's probably what you've already done. And you're, and you're, I mean, the reason you're here is because it's hard. And that reason that's hard is because of the volume of, well, there's a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons is just the sheer volume. Um, if you look here at the New York uh, passenger list that they have here, it covers 1820 to 1957. So a pretty huge time frame, relatively speaking. And if you go to the catalog and check, there are 83 million names within this data database. And that's just New York. Now, New York was the, um, was the port of entry that most people came to. I should say, uh, maybe not most, but a lot of people came to, through New York, but not all of them. Um, lots of people came to Philly, and Boston, and Baltimore, uh, and New Orleans, especially those that were coming to the Midwest. Um, but I'm gonna show you that that's not always the case. Uh, some people uh, came, people coming directly to the US, or excuse me, coming directly to the Midwest would often come into the ports on the Eastern seaboard. But um, they're all here, everything that the National Archives has um, up to, you know, a, a, a reasonable uh, level, somewhere usually in the 20th century is when they stop. Um, um, they have, but you have everything that the archives is made of it, which and you can find it in other places too. Family Search is another website that has most of the passion dates. But Ancestry has a great search engine, but it can be a little tricky. And I'm going to show you that uh, by an example. So I'm going to look for one of my ancestors. And actually what I'm gonna do here, you can look at all of the, um, again, I have to digress. Um, you can look at all of these different varieties of, of passenger, or not passenger list, of immigration documents all at one time. But all that does is add to the sheer volume of names that you're going to be searching for. And if what you're really interested in is uh, immigration, I would tell you that you should probably start with passenger list. And if you don't find them there, then maybe we can move on to border crossings or uh, pa um, um, passports or something else like that. And uh, so um, I'm going to search passenger list in order to just to give you an, an example. And I'm going to look for my ancestor and his name, the name I knew him as, was Frank Geeson. And that was the name that had been handed down to me. And so you can, that's a fairly uncommon name. That's the type of name that you can just do a search for and see what you come up with. And even a name as unusual as Frank Geeson, I get 260 hits just searching passengers. And I browsed through these a number of times and I just could not find my man. I could not find my grandfather. And so what I tell people is if you're struggling, what you really should do is try to narrow the date range that you're searching because uh, that can help, that can really help um, uh, narrow down quite a few uh, individuals, you know, people that we know for certain are not uh, our people. So one thing that I recommend is find the first um, document, identify what the, the first 
U.S. document that you can find your ancestor on. And in my case, for Frank, um, I had found his marriage record. Um, let's see, yeah. And so this was Frank's uh, record. He was listed as a Giesen, G-I-E-S-O-N-N. Um, for various reasons, double letters like that make no difference when you're searching in Ancestry, at least the way that I searched initially. So we can ignore that for now. I, I do want to mention that spelling, it, I don't like to search for um, someone's exact name because, well, frankly, spelling was terrible uh, at the time. Um, these individuals were often not writing their own name. Uh, a clerk was filling out the form for him. Uh, and so, and they, they, they just often didn't spell an individual's name right. So be open to various spellings. I knew that he married a woman named Lizzie Westerholm. So even though the spelling was not the spelling that I was aware of, I, I had a pretty I a strong feeling that this was my individual. And the earliest date I find on this record is 14 June, 1897. So that I know is the latest that Frank Giesen could have come to the United States. And so I have this uppermost bound now. Uh, and then I can just, I mean, if I have to, I can just use his birth date as the lower bound. I know he was born around 1869 or 1870. So now I've got a date range that I can enter into Ancestry. And so I'm going to come and edit my search. And uh, I'm going to put a date range. Let's see, I can't do a date range. Um, but what I can do is I can estimate. And so I can say something like, see, I know 1897 is my uppermost bound. So I can do uh, 1877, no, let's do 1887. And I can do plus or minus 10 years. And so that's going to be searching for a man named Frank Eason, who arrived sometime between 1877 and 1897. And when I do a search again, I narrow it down to 11. And that's fantastic. But when I search through here, um, none of the birth dates match. Or the arrival, uh, uh, place of arrival. I mean, I'm fairly certain my German ancestor didn't go to New South Wales, Australia first. So, you know, when I browse through here, I still can't find him. So I'm going to show you another trick. And I'm going to go back here to edit search. And this can work on any of the databases in Ancestry. Ancestry allows you to use a wildcard function. They do uh, require that you use the first three letters of a name. But what you can do then is just put an asterisk after the first three letters. So you get F-R-A asterisk for Frank. And for the name Giesen, I'm gonna do the same thing. And I'm gonna match all terms exactly. And what that's going to do is give me everyone whose first name begins with an F-R-A and a last name that begins with a G-I-E who arrived somewhere between 1877 and 1897. And when I do that search, I find maybe. Uh, I know I found him because I found him earlier. Well, let me back up. So I'm still having trouble. So what's what's the deal? I went to I decided to start looking at my other records for this man. And what I found was the 1900 census. I knew he was married in 1897. And then I find the man on the 1900 census. And this was particularly challenging to find, as you might imagine. This was indexed as Friesen, F-R-I-E-S-O-N-E. -E. So I couldn't find him using Giesen at all. Uh, but I knew this was him because his wife was Elizabeth and his children were Frank and Erwin. So, um, uh, and he was born around the right time. He was married around the right time. But what I, I really found interesting, and you can find this on any of the censuses that 
um, any U.S. census uh, that's available, any of the U.S. censuses from 1900 to 1940, the five, five most recent censuses that we have access to, they uh, almost always ask, no, I'm sure they always ask some sort of citizenship question. So if an individual was asked uh, their place of birth and they gave anything outside of the U.S., in this case, Frank listed Germany as his place of birth, they would ask this question, actually a series of three questions on the 1900 census. They asked what year, your year of immigration to the United States, the number of years that you've been in the United States, and your naturalization status. In this case, Frank says that he immigrated in 1894. He'd been here six years, and the, the abbreviation in this column is PA. So um, what they were in this naturalization question, what they're asking you is if you, if you were an immigrant to the US, uh, are you uh, a US citizen or not? And the three answers were, um, or the three uh, abbreviations that you see are either AL for alien, that means he had not begun the process of naturalizing. Um, if it was listed as PA, that means he had um, fulfilled, the, he had at least told the census taker that he had met the first step which was to declare his intent to naturalize. And then, as you can see here in this column, this man had naturalized and the, and the abbreviation is NA for naturalization. So uh, this is good because this is gonna let me, um, this t tells me that I should be looking for uh, some sort of naturalization record for Frank as well. Um, but he tells me right here that he came in 1894. Now, you can't trust them at all when it comes to giving you dates. They're, especially in this column. I don't know how many times, it's, it's, in, it's an innumerable number of times where I have uh, found them on the census and they state a date of, oh, well, I've seen them state different dates every census year. So in 1900, he'll have a, a different year. And it's usually close, it's similar, you know, say it's 1893 or 1895 instead of 1894. So you can't trust them to give you the exact year but you can usually trust them to get it about right. So now I know I'm looking at a much narrower window for Frank DC. So I'm gonna flip back to Ancestry. I'm gonna edit my search one more time and I'm gonna put a, an arrival date of 1894 and I'll say plus or minus two years, let's say. And I'll hit search. And this is where we find my man. So in this case, He's listed as Franz Giesen. And that little Z, because he's listed as Franz instead of Frank, when, that is the reason why I was not finding him when I was searching for him as Frank. And, you know, Frank, Franz is a German nickname for Frank or Francis. And they're all the same name, generally. Um, um, and which is why Francis is a good name to use this um, this um, uh, wild card. Uh, Pat is another, Patrick is another great name uh, because no matter how they spell it, Pat, Patty or Patrick, it always starts with a P-A-T. Frank is another good example of that. Fran Frank, Franz, Francis. So, um, and there are other names like that too. Uh, some names you can't, or uh, uh, you know, the nickname doesn't, uh, isn't the same, you know, Lizzie and Elizabeth. Uh, so that can be a little trouble, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a great tool for finding uh, your guy, and, and here he is arriving in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so we're gonna take a look at the record. Now, I have to be honest with you, I did use Frank because he came a little later. He came in 1894, and there's much more information on a passenger list from 1894 than there is from 1854. But in 1894, they were doing a great job of telling us all about this individual. So here's my man, Franz Niesen. He's the right age. He's listed here as a laborer. Tells me that he's from Berlin. That was news to me. And you can see that some of these are very specific. Um, there are some very small villages listed here. So if you can find your ancestors coming after 1890, they'll often tell you exactly what town or village they came from in Europe, which can be, I mean, it can be everything. It's what we're all often looking for is that village uh, we all know what country they came from, but 
uh, getting the village is what is the key to unlocking those European records. This is a major city, so it didn't help me much, but and, and he's not really from here is what I learned. He actually was just living here before he left. But that's another story. The, the thing that really showed me that uh, something was uh, right here was he was listing where he was going. And I'm not sure I can zoom in tight enough, but yeah, here you can see it. Uh, here's Berlin. And he says that he's going to St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and the question that they asked was who you were going to meet when you got there. And the answer was his parents. So I had no idea that Frank's parents had actually come here. I had no idea they had even come. Um, and it turned, but it turns out that uh, his parents came along with five of his many siblings. I, I can't even name all of them, but five of the siblings, the parents and five siblings all came on uh, another boat uh, two or three years before Frank got here. So he actually came later, which is a little unusual. You usually see it the other way. The single um, young single male will come and then uh, he'll work for a little while and establish residency and then maybe send for a, uh, a sibling or a cousin or his parents and they come along after. But in this case, Frank's parents came first and I was able to substantiate this with some other research, but um, yeah, it was, oh, and he even gives the address in which they were living uh, on Virginia Avenue at the time. So it was a fabulous find when I did find this. Um, and it took me a while, again, because of the name, but we finally managed to find it. Um, so I, I will just tell you that persistence is, is a good um, trait to have when you're doing natural or um, immigration research. Um, and what I would do is keep trying different things. Um, if the arrival date's not working, um, maybe you've got it wrong um, and you'd be better off looking for a birth year. So, you know, you can put in a rough birth year and, and do the exact same search and see what you come up with. What I would tell you to do is add one piece of information at a time. And if that one doesn't work, then um, maybe take that one out and add a different piece of information. If you have more data that you can feed in to um, the database, the search bar. Um, various spellings that, you know, obviously if you know of some spellings um, that could help you, uh, you know, if you've seen the name spelled in a variety of ways, you can just add the different spellings. Um, I tr also, I tell people to always start with these boxes unchecked, uh, not with the wild card, but when you're searching for the full name, when you're looking for, you know, and you spell the name all the way out, I, I generally tell people to search without these bars checked initially. Um, but with uh, immigration, that can be challenging because again, just sheer volume of people. So, um, the problem is, is that if I had done this search initially with the, with the, these checked, I wouldn't have found Frank either um, because, you know, he was listed as Franz and, you know, there were two ends on his name. So I, I would not have found him. Um, but uh, sometimes you just have to um, just, especially when you're dealing with a common name, if you're looking for Patrick Kelly or John Smith or something like that, you're going to have to add data. Um, is it because the volume is just too great. Um, I'm going to uh, come back here to immigration and travel and just talk about a little bit, uh, briefly just talk a little bit more about uh, these other categories that you can check and just moving around in Ancestry Library Edition. Um, we're going to talk naturalization records later. Ancestry has a great collection of naturalization records and so I probably won't mention it, but Ancestry is another good place to search for naturalization records. Um, uh, naturalizations are a little harder because they're more specific to a, a site. Um, so it's, it's better to look uh, for records rather than looking for a gigantic naturalization database. Uh, it's better to look more granularly with naturalizations, but I'll get to that in a little bit. But this is a good place to start. Um, just throw in the name in here and see what you come up with. Um, border crossings and passports. So not everyone uh, came by sea. A lot of people did uh, because um, a lot of Im Im uh, immigration was coming from the Eastern hemisphere to the Western hemisphere. 
it's a big two big bodies of water that we had to cross but um, some people came in um, through Canada or even Mexico and then up or down depending um, there are uh, border crossing records most of them begin around the turn of the 20th century so if your ancestors came from prior to that uh, it's likely if they cross the border uh, between either of these those two countries um, they just walked in and there was no record of them coming or going. Um, and that was fairly common uh, in the 19th century. I, I, lots and lots of Irish um, came to Canada first because Frank, um, the, uh, the, um, the cost uh, of, of, a, uh, of a, a, a ticket to Canada was cheaper than it was to the US. So, um, often the Irish who fully intended to come to the United States would just take the ship to Canada and then come in um, over the border. Um, there are also passport records that they have. Again, those are primarily, um, um, well, how can I say this? There is travel and so a surprising amount of travel um, to and from in the 19th century. Um, uh, lots of uh, individuals would come to the U.S., establish residency, and then maybe go back to the uh, old country and uh, find a wife or get his wife who he had left with, you know, and come back again. So you can find individuals coming and going. You can also find them at, um, uh, on these passport records um, applying for a passport. But it's, it's not very common um, for most of our immigrant ancestors to make that journey more than once. Um, crew lists, if your ancestor was ever a sailor, this is a possibility you should uh, take a look at. Um, there are also immigration books, uh, um, outbound immigration books from uh, European countries. So for instance, um, one of the outbound um, sets of records is, uh, is uh, from Hamburg. And if I can quickly find them, let's see, let's do this. No, spell word. Well, yeah, here we go. And I can do this same search. I'll look for Franz this time. And uh, we'll see what we find. Yeah, here he is. Two ends and Franz again. I'm beginning to see a pattern. I'm, I'm thinking that maybe his name was changed after he died. But this is the Hamburg passenger list. So these are outbound passenger lists and they don't exist for very many ports. Hamburg is the primary one that we, that these records survive from, but um, these can be excellent as well because they, they, these were Germans writing this information down for Germans. So they're much more likely to spell the name correctly, to spell the names of towns correctly, although the handwriting is just as bad. Here's my guy, Franz Giesen, 27 years old, from Berlin. And he was listed actually, in this case, he was listed as a, uh, a barber. This was his occupation. Yeah. So um, anyway, another resource that you can find there. Um, and let's see, let's go back to immigration and travel just for one more thing. Oh, ships, pictures, and descriptions. Once you have a, uh, you've identified the passenger uh, or the, the ship that your ancestor came on, you can often find those records here. And you have to come to uh, actually this database that's li just listed as passenger ships and images. This, for some reason, on this particular database, they don't offer you a chance to search by um, ship name. But if you come to this one listed passenger list, list, you can do a search. Franz came in on a ship called the California. So let's see what we find. Well, there were a variety of ships and they give you the date ranges when they were in operation and the shipping line that built them. And if they have them, they give you pictures of the ships. I don't think this is my ship, 
or Franz's ship, I should say. But you know, it, it's it's an it's an amazing thing to find a picture of the actual ship that you're in. You know, you can you can just imagine them standing there. Um, so just another resource that Ancestry has. Another way to search Ancestry is to come to the rather than going to Immigration and Travel, you can come to the card catalog, and you can narrow by. Uh, the type of, of collection that you want to look at. So in this case, I want to go immigration travel and then I can further filter the collection. So just another way to access all the records. Another thing that you can do, the handy thing that you can do here um, is, and of course my, you can uh, change, you can sort this by different uh, uh, criteria and you can sort by record count. So you can see the databases that are the largest. And in this case, New York has 83 million names. In it. The next closest is the UK. So these are British outbound passenger lists. And they, for some reason, the records only um, survived from this time period, 1890 to 1960, unfortunately, because most of our English um, uh, ancestors came long before 1890. But if you had recent uh, um, immigration from the UK or Ireland, um, you might be able to find their outbound passenger list here as well. And then uh, all the ports are listed here. And so if you know which port you came, your ancestor came in, but you don't know which ship or, or when he got here, um, this can be a, a, a great way to narrow things down too. So I think that's about ancestry. Let's jump to find my past. And I wanna do that by going back to the homepage. So find my past is another database that we subscribe to. I kind of think of Find My Past as the ancestry for the UK, um, for uh, uh, Great Britain and Ireland. Um, so if I come to the homepage and I go to research and online genealogy resources, and I scroll all the way to the bottom of the page, one, you'll find Find My Past. Ah, it's in library use only, so I won't go into too much detail. There isn't a ton here, uh, but when, I can show you what we do have. This is what Find My Past looks like today. Don't worry, tomorrow it'll be something different. They're changing their website all the time. You can just put a name in here. Uh, I tend to not like to do that because what I get is a huge list of names. So one way around that is to scroll all the way to the bottom of the page and click on um, uh, search family records. Yes, that's it. And then you can narrow here uh, by immigration and travel. One of the reasons why I wanted to bring up Find My Past is because they have a couple of databases that, um, that are uh, online that these are print collections that we have at the library that um, since uh, we're not open right now, you could maybe use Find My Past to, to look at these you know, at home. Um, two of them that I wanna mention are, are the Germans to America. So. Uh, if any of you are familiar with that uh, resource, it's a, it's a collection, it's a multi-volume set of, uh, it's just essentially an index to uh, passenger lists of German um, um, ships coming, you know, full of, of Germans coming to the U.S. And uh, they're in, the volumes are in chronological order, but you can search by name on here as well as in the book form. And it's just a, it's another set of eyes, and and I, and I tell people, you know, if they're, if they're struggling with immigration, um, it's it's really good to try other resources, even if they're indexing the same records, right? So Ancestry indexed the New York passenger list, and a lot of these records from Germans to America are from the New York passenger list, as well as Baltimore and Philly and all the other places, but. It was a different set of eyes. It was a different group of people who were indexing the records for Germans to America. The same records, but different people, different interpretations of the handwriting. Um, and I think probably since they were uh, specific to Germans, probably a lot more familiar with German names and, and uh, so just more likely to get the names right in the index from my experience. Um, there's also a set of books um, that we own uh, called the Irish Famine Immigrants. They're also here, a couple of other databases. Um, and then of course the UK outbound passenger list. But again, Find My Past is only available in library. Um, and so you'll have to wait to 
access it um, sometime in the future. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the other uh, websites. I want to mention just quickly, um, if you want a couple of free websites that you can access, um, this one is listed on the handout as, um, it's actually listed as libertyellisfoundation.org. But when you type that into the URL, it automatically redirects you to this new website called statueofliberty.org. But um, they're part of the Ellis Island complex. And you, if you want, you can come here and search the family uh, or the passenger lists here. Um, uh, you go to Family History Center and visit passenger search and start your search. And you can just do a search here. You do have to create an account. Um, but I, I think it's free. Um, the uh, other Castle Garden was um, just a, a little backstory. Ellis Island, people often, um, the family lore says that your immigrant ancestor came through Ellis Island. Well, that may not necessarily be true. In fact, if they came before 1900, they almost, um, they, they, it was highly unlikely that they actually, well, actually, I should say 18. 93. They came before 1893. They didn't come into Ellis Island because it didn't exist. They went into a, a different immigration uh, facility, and that was known as Castle Garden. And th those records are also available. Uh, let's see if I can find the website here real quick. Oh, my drop down menu is in the way. No, I didn't include it. Did I include it? No, I didn't include it on my tab. So, um, Nonetheless, it, it's, it's now at Ellis Island, you can, you, you're not just searching the records of Ellis Island, the people that came in from 1893 to 1924. You're searching all of the New York passenger list. You're searching Castle Garden as well as Ellis Island. So you're searching all the New York passenger records at both places, now the Castle Garden website and the Ellis Island website. So uh, the only other thing that I will mention is family search. Family Search has also has the passenger lists, um, and they are in the process of indexing if they have not already done so. And you can access those here by going to Search and Records. Um, again, this is FamilySearch.org. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but this is one of the this is the website for the Family History Library, which is the largest genealogical library in the world. And, They've done a, there's a lot of amazing stuff here. You could just get lost in family search. Uh, and we're going to cover it a little bit on naturalization too. But for immigration purposes, you should probably just use their indexes. Um, and to do that, to search immigration, uh, you come to search records, and that takes you to this website. And then you can just narrow, um, you can narrow by type, which is right here. And when you hit that button, this drop down menu appears and you can choose immigration and naturalization. And then you can just do your search natural, you know, normally like you would. Now I'm looking for Franz Giesen, since I know that's how, oops, since I know that's how they spell his name. Oh, I should have, uh, oh, you do have to create an account at Family Search, um, but uh, to even to search the indexes. But, um, and I, and I forgot the extra in, so I'm going to go ahead and add that in, and I'm going to update the search and see if I, if I get in. Yeah, there he is coming into Pennsylvania. Yeah, so they have them too. And this little camera over here on the right side, uh, this means that there's a digital image that you can view, and so you can click on it, and it will take you to the original record. And Family Search again is, oh, I'm sorry. This is, ah, uh, I see. So, um, um, they didn't, they weren't indexing the original records. They are actually indexing an index. So they have just, um, someone had, someone else likely at the National Archives or um, created this uh, card for every individual, an index card. And so this was the old way we used to search for things before everything went online. Um, so um, that's interesting to learn, but that's another, just another piece of evidence that you could find. I mean, it's possible that you could find this index card and not the original passenger list. 
um, you know, because the passenger list was lost sometime between the time he was indexed. So this could be your only uh, record of him coming into the country. But this could also be as uh, a great uh, supplemental piece of uh, information. Yeah. So um, fa family search is free again, uh, as long as you create an account, which is free to get. So. Um, all right. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. Obviously, if you're, if you're having trouble with immigration and or anything, immigration or naturalization, you're welcome to call us at any time and, and we can try to help you and maybe give you some more ideas. Um, for, for now, I'm gonna move on to naturalization. And I'm gonna talk a little, I'm gonna read a little bit from my um, um, handout, but I won't read too much. Um, uh, with naturalization, it's a different date, not rather than 1820, which you have for immigration. Nat the naturalization date that you really want to keep in mind is 1906. So uh, the U.S. Uh, first naturalization law was in March 26 of 1790. Um, it set out the requirements for an individual to obtain citizenship. In citizenship. Uh, it also uh, set the required number of years of residence in a particular state and years of, of living in the U.S. before you could apply for citizenship. And they, and the U.S. Congress changed this uh, numerous times. I mean, I can't even keep track of the number of times that they changed the amount of years that you had to be here in the United States and how number of years you had to be a resident. Um, but um, the law was repealed many times and amended many times. Um, the important date is 1906. So in, in 1906, um, the U.S. government created a, a Bureau of Immigration and Naturalization. And its purpose was to provide for a uniform rule for the naturalization of aliens throughout the U.S. Again, I'm going to digress, but um, the previous law for naturalizations only stated that you could file a petition for naturalization in any common law court of record. So that means that a person, once they has had established residency in the, a particular state and had been there a certain amount of time, he could go into a court that had its jurisdiction, that he was living in, in whose jurisdiction he was living, he could go to that court and apply for citizenship. And that means criminal court, probate court, uh, court of common pleas, chancellery court, district court, circuit court, supreme state supreme court, even federal U.S. Supreme Court, any court that you that an individual was living in their um, um, I'm sorry in in their jurisdiction, you could go in and apply for naturalization. So these records are not kept in any uniform uh, place. They're primarily kept at the county level. So these are county level records. And so this is where you need to start when you're doing naturalization research. You want to identify where your ancestor was living, when they likely naturalized. And you can get, you know, start to uh, get this sort of information from uh, the census and your other research, your birth, marriage, and, and death research, your and baptisms, and, and this kind of thing. And you sort of, uh, and, and of course, you, as I showed you on Frank's um, uh, census, you can just flat out get it. You know, he can tell, he'll tell you straight out that he has declared his intent to naturalize, or he's already naturalized. And so then you've got a nice little window that you can uh, search for. And and so, and you also know the time frame that you need to be searched and, and the place. So once you've identified the time frame, then you go figure out where was Frank living in that time period. And you dig into the court records there. So with the state of Missouri, let's talk about, now there are naturalization records. Oh, let's go back to 1906. So there's pre-1906 and post-1906. After 1906, all the records are at the National Archives. And the simple thing you can do is just request a copy of the of your naturalization paperwork from the National Archives, and you can do that. Um, let's see, if I go to the National National Archives website, let's see, I'm having terrible trouble seeing. Yes, 
find. So this is the National Archives. And if you go to, uh, let's see. No. I just Googled it. Um, if you go to the National Archives um, and uh, search for immigration records, you'll find it. And they talk about it, uh, the, this cutoff date and where you can, what records have survived. They also talk about some other sources that I haven't mentioned that you should take a look at. And they also have a place where you can um, request a copy of the naturalization records. And I am blanking right now exactly where that is on the website, but it's here. And I should know because uh, this website is challenging enough as it is without me just telling you to go there. But, um, but uh, here it is, right here. So uh, from that uh, naturalization records page, you can scroll down and you can uh, click here to order copies of naturalization records. That's for everything from 1906 to present, basically. Um, we have some records for the courts that were located here in St. Louis, the US District Court and the US Circuit Court. So after 1906, there were only two courts that you could, in the St. Louis area at least, that you could um, apply for citizenship. And that's the US Circuit Court and the US District Court. And we have some records for both. They're not very extensive, but I'll show you what we have because we've indexed them all. Uh, so if we go back over to our website, and if you, I'm gonna to go to the home page. And in this case, if you come to research and you choose indexes um, and finding aids, you'll get a list of topics and they're in alphabetical order and if you scroll down to naturalization records uh, and click on St. Louis, Missouri naturalization index, you'll get uh, these links um, this one is a link to the records for St. Louis uh, created prior to 1906. And this is a list of, uh, this is an index to naturalization records created after 1906. And again, we don't have everything that has ever existed for the city of St. Louis pre-1906 or post-1906. But we've indexed everything we own. So if you want to know if we have uh, a naturalization for your individual. You can come here and you can search the indexes and you look for your individual and it will give you the court number, it'll give you our film number, it'll give you the family history library film number, the volume, the page, and so on. So if you were to find this individual and you wanted a copy of, uh, of this record, you could send us an email and say, you know, and just copy the information from this line, you know, you're in, in whatever your individual's line is, and send us that information, and we'll make a microfilm copy of it, and we'll send it back to you. For free. So um, uh, let me back up uh, and just mention that uh, our email address is here. It's uh, the word genealogy at slcl.org, and you can send a request anytime you want for our naturalization records, or as you can see, we have lots of other indexes besides naturalization records that you can find here. And if, if you find uh, your ancestor's name on any of these records, you can send us uh, a request through email and we'll make a copy for you. Um, another alternative uh, is uh, state archives. So in this case, I'm gonna show you Missouri, but any of the 50 states, I mean, most of the 50 states has a state archives where you can um, check to see if they have naturalization records. The Missouri State Archives is fantastic. They've naturalized a number of records for the state of Missouri. And if you go to, uh, uh, let's see here. Let me back up here a little bit. Just quickly, I want to show you the main page. If you go to records and archives and go to Missouri Digital Heritage, actually, that's where you need to go, Missouri Digital Heritage. This is what it looks like. And what I typically like to do is come to browse collections and go by topic. And then I come down to genealogy. And then you will get a list of all of the databases that they've created for the records that they own. And sometimes uh, there are records that you can find nowhere else. So this is a great place to look for uh, your ancestors if, if they were from the state of Missouri. And they're in alphabetical order and I'm gonna scroll down here and find Missouri uh, naturalization records. 
I'm going to click View Collection. I don't know. I don't know if you noticed that, but it said there were only 22 of Missouri's counties here, so they haven't indexed them all. But what they have done is they have indexed uh, St. Louis. So in this case, I'm going to look for Franz. I'm going to take a look at Giessen, and I do a search, and I don't have a Franz, but I do have a Gustav, and I found out that this is my guy's brother. He's one of the, the, the his siblings that came. And when I click on view details here, uh, I get all this great information about the volume and page and the date. And you can take, again, you can take this information and you can send us a request and we'll find this, because we own these records as well. Anything, most likely anything at the Missouri State Archives we own because we bought all of our film from the Missouri State Archives. This is just, again, another index, another set of eyes. And uh, again, you can just send us this information and uh, we'll send you a copy of it. Uh, so I've talked about our records. I've talked about the Missouri State Archives. I want to mention that neither of these databases is comprehensive. They don't have every naturalization record that's appeared in St. Louis City. It's just everything that we have, um, everything that we still have access to. And I did talk about the National Archives already. So, um, I mean, I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that these naturalization records are often found at the county level. And we have made a point of identifying indexes. People will often go into these county courthouses and index the records and then um, publish a book of this index. And we get them for all over the country. And I just want to show you where you can search to see if we have an index to a, to a county that's not St. Louis. Um, um, so you can come to the St. Louis County Library website and you can search our catalog by going to books, e-media and more. You just hover over that tab and then you click on catalog and I would recommend doing a search like um, Franklin County, let's see if I can spell, Missouri, Naturalizations. I knew I would spell this wrong. Well, let's take out a Let's just do Frank. Try that. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of books for Franklin County, but the, my point that I was trying to make, if I can find it, I'm sorry. Everyone. There we go. I narrowed the naturalization records. Let's try this again. I don't know how I spelled that wrong, but let's try this in Franklin. All right, there we go. And you notice there's, a, there's this naturalization records index for Franklin County. There's actually two entries here. And whenever you see a book, the exact same book listed twice in our card catalog, that means we have a circulating copy as well as a reference copy. So there's a book that always stays here. And a second copy is the same book that you can check out. So. Uh, if you were doing Franklin County research and you came across this book on our card catalog and you notice that, uh, you can also tell if you go into the entry and the call number here, as long as there isn't an R in front of the call number, that means it's circulating and that means you can check it out. And so this book, you could just request it and have it sent to your branch, whatever branch that you want to pick it up at, and you can look at this book yourself. You can also, if we don't have two copies of it and we only have a reference copy, feel free to, again, send us an email and say, hey, can you look for John Smith in this particular book? And we'll be happy to you. And if we find it, we'll uh, make a copy from the book and we'll email it to you for free. And um, yeah. And we, you know, again, we've made a point of trying to acquire as many as these as we can for all over the country, not just Missouri or, um, uh, you know, any of, especially states that fed Missouri, this has been a priority. Um, there are also, I, I mean, I, I briefly touched on uh, naturalization records at Ancestry and um, FamilySearch 
Um, Heritage Quest is another place they have a database, but Heritage Quest is owned by Ancestry at this point, so that database has migrated over to Ancestry. So I think that I've covered everything that I wanted to cover today. And I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to back up and at least go to our homepage if I can. And I'm going to try to answer any questions that you might have tonight. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put up our um, contact information. Let me share my screen here. Uh, can you stop your sharing your screen? Absolutely. Okay. Whoops, whoops, sorry. Are we all having fun learning? I, uh, <clears throat> there we go, okay. There we go, there's our contact information. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we did have a, cu a couple questions. Um, so one of, one of the things I did want to talk about is we did have some questions in the Q&A about um, can people living outside of the St. Louis area or in other states use, get a library card and then use the databases? And so I just want to say that, um, um, that in order to use the library databases remotely with a library card, you have to be a resident of the St. Louis metropolitan area. So um, if you live in the city of St. Louis in the city of, um, or in the county of St. Louis or in St. Charles County, you can automatically get a, a library card. If you live outside of those areas, but still in the metropolitan area, and that's kind of restricted to some of the counties, uh, there is a, I believe a $50 charge per year, but you can still use the databases. But beyond that, um, we are restricted, uh, uh, we cannot offer remote access to, to databases and that's a restriction put on by our database vendors, not by the library. So I will put a link in the chat uh, with a, uh, a page that with to a page with information about getting a library card and uh, if you're interested in that. Um, so this was a question going back to the, I think when you were talking about the Philbies and the question is, does the index give the ship's name? It often does, um, and if it doesn't, it refers you to the source where the information came from, and that m almost certainly will give you the name of the ship. Okay, um, let's see, we had a question about what the charge for copies is. Um, we do not charge for copies. Um, you know, usually we try to return the results by uh, email, via email, we, we digitize the records, then send them via email. There is no charge for that. Um, if you can't receive them by email, we can send you paper copies. We still wouldn't charge for that. Uh, of course, donations are always appreciated. Okay, another question. I have found on census records that my great grandfather was listed as being naturalized. However, however, I see no mention for my great grandmother being naturalized. Is that normal that the husband naturalized but not the wife? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'll take it. It is normal. Um, basically, um, prior to 1922, uh, women received their naturalization. I mean, they could apply for citizenship, but it wasn't very common. Um, most women got their citizenship either through their father or through marrying a citizen uh, or their husband, if their husband uh, became a, a naturalized citizen. I have got some examples of women naturalizing uh, um, in the 1920s and 1910s. Um, it, it's funny, it's often nuns, uh, but, uh, um, but yes, occasionally, I, I should say, for the most part, um, it, you won't find the record of a, of a, a woman um, being naturalized. 
they usually get their nat their citizenship through their father or their husband. Okay, another question. Are family members listed together on the passenger list? Well, most of the time, yes. Uh, especially, new, uh, you know, immediate family, um, husband and wife and children. I have found people that were seem to be traveling together, same, you know, seem to be from the same family that are listed at two different places on a passenger list. But usually if it's, it's parents and children, they're normally listed together. Yeah, I would just say that, that um, anybody that was on the ship when it arrived is listed on the manifest. You know, and oftentimes, you know, family members who are traveling together are listed adjacently on the list, you know, um, sometimes they aren't, but oftentimes they are. That's been my experience anyway. Okay. Um, can St. Louis County res St. Louis County residents use St. Louis City Libraries genealogy resources? If so, how do we do that? Well, I mean, uh, it, it. I guess it depends on what you're talking about. Um, I, well, actually, the answer is yes, of course. Um, the, the city library's collections are open to anybody. I mean, anybody from anywhere can go into physically to the building and use, use the collections. Um, we do have reciprocal borrowing agree, uh, agreements with the city. So actually you can, you will, in order to borrow from the city, you will need a city library card, but all you have to do is, um, actually I think they have an online process where you can get a card or you can go to any branch, you know, and as long as you can, you know, bring something, a proof of address, then you can get a city library card. Once you get that city library card, you will be able to use their databases from their website as well, as long as, you know, they uh, provide uh, remote access. And I'll just mention that there's, there's also a, a page on our website where if you don't have a library card, uh, but you're a county resident you can you can apply for a, a St. Louis County Library card online at this time. Yeah. Okay here is a question. Um, the passenger lists are generally compiled in the order that the ticket was purchased. Family members may may be separated if they purchased their ticket at a later date. Huh. So thank you Susan for that uh, clarification. That's helpful. Um, another question. I am trying to get a church record of a church out of business. It refers me to St. Louis Genealogical Society. Can I get onto that site through the library site? Okay, <clears throat> St. Louis County Library and St. Louis Genealogical Society are two totally separate organizations. We do have their library collection, or I should say they donated their library collection to us in 1998, but we're two separate organizations, and so you will have to go to their website and I can certainly put that in the chat. So, um, hold on, let me... Let me get that information in the chat real quick. Are there any other questions while we're waiting? So the address of St. Louis Genealogical Society is simply stlgs.org, if you can't see the chat there. So any other questions? Um, we do have our contact information up on the screen here. Uh, we are always help, happy to try to help you out. So please give us a call or send us an email. We do have... Um, a lookup service. We have an online lookup form. Uh, we can we can look up information in uh, index sources, and we are always happy to, happy to try to give you research advice. So uh, feel free to email us or give us a call, and we'll try to help you out. Okay. If there are no other. Uh, 
questions or comments, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. If you have further questions or comments, please feel free to contact History and Genealogy at 314-994-3300 or by email at genealogy at slcl.org. If you are watching this live, I remind you that this class has, has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website at www.slcl.org slash genealogy and the library's YouTube channel. If you are watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment below. Okay, I think we have a few more questions. Okay. Or comments. Oh, thank you and great job. Thank you for those comments. Uh, let me see. Just let me check the chat here. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all the good comments and thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, with that, I think we will go ahead and end the Zoom session. So have a good evening and stay safe out there.